Welcome back to The Yard. Once again, I'm your uh, fill-in host, Marlon Gardner. Marcus Preciado is taking the day off, uh, but that's okay. It's another beautiful day uh, in Southern California. Uh, I want to give you a little update. Uh, last you saw me, uh, I was either interviewing the great Todd Durkin or giving you an update on where we were in our case here in California to get sports back. Uh, the update is very simple. All sports can finally resume in California. So as you can imagine, we're excited. Uh, it's a blessing for a lot of kids who were dealing with a lot of uh, tough situations, a lot of issues. Uh, but again, the blessings are here and the kids are going back to sports. But speaking of sports, uh, you barely know me. Uh, I can tell you, based on what I'm wearing today, I'm an Oklahoma State Cowboy, where I had the great fortune of playing baseball for Gary Ward uh, back in the old Big Eight days. Uh, probably one of the best times of my life. Uh, couldn't, wouldn't trade it for anything in the world. But uh, we've got a guest today that's special. He made it a little farther than Oklahoma State. Uh, so I want to introduce him to you. Today with us on the, on the yard is Fernando Cortez, former Major League Baseball player. Uh, let's meet Fernando. How you doing? I'm doing well, how you doing? Great to have you in the yard. Thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, you're a local guy. Yep. Tell us about yourself. Uh, local from San Diego. Um, I'm talking local, local. So I played Little League down there. I uh, went to elementary school, middle school, high school, and college. So I went to Helix High School, um, Grossmont College, and then I got drafted out of there by the Devil Rays in 2001, and then played pro ball for about 10, 11 years. You know, it's always interesting how lives or paths cross. I went to Mission Bay in San Diego, and there was a kid there who I think maybe did a little time in major leagues, but ended up at Arizona State, Sean Reese. He was a pitcher, and he drew my attention to that particular high school at the time. I didn't live in the area, but I was motivated by baseball. Obviously, you know, yeah. we get to play year round here in Southern California. Yeah. And there was a kid at Helix named Rob Ippolito. Okay. Uh, just an amazing pitcher. He went to U of A. Uh, and that actually got me thinking about baseball and college, and it really sort of changed the direction of my life. How did this, how did this baseball thing work for you? For me, I mean, I love sports in general. So, um, and I'm obviously going to get, got to give you some credit and commend you for getting these guys back out in the field, boys and girls Thank back you. in California playing sports. Without sports for me, I mean, to be honest with you, I don't, I don't know where, where I would have been. Um, I grew up in Southeast San Diego, so I was dodging gangs. I was dodging, you know, what lifestyle is really going to live. Um, you know, my mother was a single mom. I didn't grow up with a dad, so she raised me and my sister. Mm -hmm. She worked two, three jobs and sports for me was my outlet. So I played baseball, I played basketball, I played football, I ran track. I was the kid that was going from the, you know, running track, putting my baseball uniform in the back of the car, and then getting to the baseball field. So I always had a passion for baseball, um, sports in general, but baseball was, for some reason, I liked hitting the baseball. I liked yeah. diving and making the plays. Um, I like the concept of playing a team sport, but having that individual effort. Yeah. Um, you know, I liked when people gave me those standing ovations when I made the good play. Um, but then I also liked um, contributing with the team and you know, obviously trying to see if we can win the game. So it was, it was a tough balance for me in baseball because I can go five for five and then we lose. So I can't be super <laughs> happy. Because I, you know, oh, the yeah, team the, looks at it differently. We had to wait till you get, we had to wait till you got home. Yeah, I had to wait till I got <laughs> home. Um, it's funny, to this day, my mom says, um, she goes, I used to hate when you guys would lose. And I said, why? She goes, because you'd sit in the back of the car and you wouldn't talk to anyone. Mm -hmm. And then the moment you would talk is when we asked the question. The question was, what are you upset about? And she said that I would just go off. Yeah. You know, he didn't do this. He didn't, you know, so, <laughs> and, you know, from a very young age, um, I think sports was something that drew, would drive me. Um, didn't matter what sport I was playing, but for some reason, baseball just always was, you know, the dream. Something embedded in me said, you know, I want to be a baseball player, yeah. and, and that's what I chased harder than any other sport. I stopped at Oklahoma State. What, what made you go well beyond? How did? What, what about you got you to the big leagues? I mean. I look back now as I'm older, I mean, definitely was blessed with talent. Um, I was physically smaller than everybody else. Um, but at some point, I ended up growing. So the talent, athleticism grew into the actual physical body, and I was able to put it all together at a late age. I, this didn't happen until I graduated from high school or going into my freshman year in college. Um, out of high school, I literally had one offer. It was Bethany College in Kansas. 
And I mean, I had guys on my team in my league that ended up having multiple scholarship offers to D1 schools. Mm -hmm. um, and I literally thought about going to play in Bethany. And you know, I said, well, this is my only offer. Um, something told me in my gut and my soul, my spirit told me, hey, stay, stay put, be patient. Um, I felt like the Lord was telling me to stay home um, and, and you know, figure out what are you gonna do with your life here as you grow and mature. Um, so that's what I did, stayed home. Um, stayed at, at the house. My mom cooked me, you know, good meals. Yeah, yeah. I, I would drive to Grossmont College, and you know, it all kind of came together. It was that perfect, perfect scenario? Um, outside of that, I, I I feel like I worked really hard. Um, I put in the work. Um, I I would hit 200, 300 balls a day. I would take yeah. 200, 300. You know, I was I was grinding. I came from, you know, like I played at Helix. So basketball, 5 a.m. in the morning football like you know the grind I do so I had that mentality as a football basketball guy playing baseball I felt like the athleticism ended up helping with that the work ethic and then you know just right right place right time before I ask you where you played for those who don't know you uh, I remember a name from Grossmont College uh, we thought of him as a legendary coach but he had a very unique characteristic about him. You didn't play for Olsen, did you? I did play for Olsen. Uh, that unique characteristic was his mouth. His mouth. Uh, you didn't have to play for him to understood. He was a little intense. Very intense. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are characters that live in your head forever. Yeah. Uh, and, and I came across him, I guess it's almost 30 years ago, yeah. but not somebody that I, that I could forget. Oh, yeah. uh, I'm sure there were some figures in your life, um, influences in your life, that helped you as you were going through that. Talked a lot about your mother. Uh, I'm assuming your mother's one of those one of those big influences. Oh yeah, she's definitely she's number one. Um, to be honest with you, I've had tons of coaches that um, you know are either coaches, mentors, which I still hold you know dear to my heart right now. Still speak to them. Um, I grew up at the Lemon Grove Rec Center, mm -hmm. so I I mean I literally could go down the list and I don't forget them. Mm -hmm. Mom is number one, and the funny thing is they all know mom's number one. That's right. You know when they see her, they're like, hey, what's up, mom? Because you know they were. They would come pick me up. They'd take me to practice. I would, they, they would share me. Yeah. Football coach yeah. would share me with the basketball coach, vice versa with the baseball coach. And um, everyone knew, like, hey, don't worry about your son. We will take care of him. So they all took care of me while she was taking care of, you know, life and taking care of what she needed to take care of. Um, so my biggest thing always as a kid, too, growing up, I said, I'm going to make it to the big leagues. I'm going to show I'm gonna show everybody what I yeah. can do. Um, you know, I'm going to prove to them, you know, that I can make it and I'm going to show my mom and, you know, everything. You know, we didn't have money, but somehow I had cleats. You know, we didn't have money, but somehow I had the bat. Yeah. You know, and, and that bat might have lasted three, four, five years, yeah. but I had it. You know what I mean? So she was definitely number one. Um, I definitely, without her, without her pushing me, you know, I'm not sitting here right now talking to you. So you go from Grossmont College, what was the next step for you? So I went to Grossmont for uh, for two years, got drafted by the Devil Rays, um, 2001, and two weeks later, I signed a contract. I was on a plane, playing in the New York Penn League, um, and I remember that. That's when that's when everything to me just became real. Um, real good or real bad? Real, like okay. real, like like this is real life. Yeah. And you know, you go through that moment where you're getting drafted and recruited, and mm -hmm. you know, I'm and I'm doing workout pre-draft workouts for major league teams. And I have, you know, like I said, in, in high school, I had one offer. Now I'm, you know, every time I go to the mailbox, I got a school. Yeah. You name the school yeah. in the country, yeah. it's, it's trying to get me. Yeah. And now I'm, and I'm 19, so I just don't know how to handle this stuff. Um, but I finally signed, went, and I was an All-American my sophomore year leaving Grossmont. Mm -hmm. And I had a little cockiness to me, a little edge to me. And I think you all have you to have, have that. To. If, you, if you don't have it in baseball, where you're going to fail seven out of ten times, yep. it'll crush you if you don't think you're something special and, and have some place to go. Absolutely. No. Absolutely. And, and that's a fine line between being arrogant, cocky, and but you have to believe in yourself. You have to know you don't get that far without believing in yourself first. And the whole flight all the way to New York, I was like, you're an All-American, you're good you've gone this far, you're going to take over, you're going to do this. I remember landing in New York, getting to the field, they're already there for like a couple days, because yeah. I had signed later, and I, I go out to the field and they're all stretching, I'm looking around, they're throwing the ball, and I'm like, okay, everybody's good. Everybody's the same. And this, is just, my, yeah. and this yeah. is just my team, yeah. not even the other teams yeah. in the league or yeah. the other leagues and divisions. So I remember just sitting there going, wow, okay, this is real. 
This yeah. is when it came, you know, fully around, and I said to myself, okay, I got to do something that is going to separate myself from all these other guys because they're all good. Yeah, no, I get it. And, and you're, you're not getting mom's home cooking? Nope. You're upstate New York somewhere uh, on your own for the Kipsy. first time. Poughkeepsie, New York. Poughkeepsie. I, I, I'm from Brooklyn. Okay. Uh, I, I didn't even know a place called Poughkeepsie existed. Yep. When you live anywhere near the city, that's, that's the only... That's my mom was born in Brooklyn. Brooklyn, that's, that's the whole world. You knew, though, when you were there, and a little cocky, but, but meeting your, your, you know, your match in a couple of ways, you knew you weren't alone. Right. You knew the Lord was there with you. Absolutely. Yeah. That, that helps. Uh, I remember going to the Midwest for the first time from Southern California, and it's a different world. Mm -hmm. So I can't imagine the pressures of going across the country, playing baseball at a different level, using the wood bat for the first time. Mm -hmm. How was that early transition on your own? For me, honestly, the, the wood bat, the transition going into the pro atmosphere wasn't too tough for me because I had a, um, one of my best friends that I went to high school with, Trey Richards, his dad played for the Padres. Um, Gene Richards, mm -hmm. and he would drive me up to uh, like Elsinore Storm. We'd go there on the weekends, and we'd go hit with the team on the field with the wood. We're swinging like 34, 31 Garrett Anderson bats, Tim Salmon, and so that part of it wasn't like it wasn't tough for me to adjust because I was around the locker room and I was swinging the wood, and you know I was taking infield with yeah, Mario yeah. Mendoza and all these guys that were, you know, at these high levels and, and coaching these guys. Um, for me, it was more so, you know, not getting mom's home cooking, um, yeah. living in a host family, yeah. uh, people, strangers, I don't even know who they are. <laughs> I don't know where I'm at. And you know, back then there's no, there's no iPhones and all this, like the no. GPS, it, it doesn't work. You were just lost. You're, you're just then. lost. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's funny. And you talked about the Lord being there with you. That's actually the first time, you know, outside of me knowing who God was and knowing um, that God existed. It was the first time ever that I actually had to find someone that wasn't physically there with me all the time to know that somebody was with me. And funny story is I ended up, I hit a double to left center around the second base one game, rolled my ankle. So they told me I was going to be out five to six weeks. It was a high uh, third degree ankle sprain. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was hitting really well at the time. So I'm going through all the rehab. It's the first time I've ever been injured ever in my life. Um, you know, when you get injured as a kid, you put some dirt on it, yeah, it's on. No, I, on. high ankle sprain, I couldn't even do yeah, anything. You were out. You were so down. I'm getting treatment, stem work, getting the whole nine. And that's when I'm, you know, now I'm searching. What am I doing with my life? Well, we had Baseball Chapel. And I didn't know what Baseball Chapel was. Mm -hmm. They said every Sunday morning, mm -hmm. we have Baseball Chapel. And I remember, this is, this is crazy, but the guy would come in, he'd ask, hey guys, I'm having baseball chapel outside. And I'd look around the locker room and nobody would go. Yeah. No one would go. And that, I don't know if it was the Lord telling me to go to baseball chapel because he wanted me to hear the word, or he was saying, hey man, you feel really bad for that guy because no one's going out there. Yeah. And I felt bad because every time he would do it. So I said, you know what, I'll go. So I went outside, it was like me and another person. And then I started going a little bit more and I remember him saying, hey guys, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a breakfast um, in three days at this diner. Who wants to come? Not a single person <laughs> raises their hand. So what do I do? Raise, Raise my hand. hand. I gotta go. yeah. I'm the only person that shows up to the diner in Poughkeepsie, New York yeah. with this chaplain, uh -huh. right? Which uh -huh. remember, I didn't know what baseball chapel was. Yeah. So I'm sitting down from him and we're just talking and you know, he's, he's preaching to me. He's telling yeah. me all this. Yeah. And I'm just 19 years old. I have no idea. All I know is I got a hurt ankle. And I asked him, hey, can the Lord heal my ankle? Yeah, that's right. Got a little greedy. Yeah. But, and oh, I wasn't saved then. Yeah. I wasn't saved then. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So this is, this is, you know, just a person talking to him. I, I don't have no idea the implication of what, 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 I, what I was asking. Yeah. And I said, you know, can the Lord heal my ankle? Mm -hmm. And he's like, yeah, absolutely. I said, okay. So well, I'll listen to everything you got to tell me. So he was telling me everything. So then I started asking questions. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm asking about creation. I'm asking about evolution. I'm asking all these other things that I always had questions to that really nobody gave me the answers to. Yeah. And towards the end of it, I was like, okay, cool. You know, he prayed and then I'm getting in my host family's car and I'm trying to leave to go to the stadium. And all of a sudden I look over and he's in the passenger seat. And I'm like, hey, and he goes, you want to give, you want to give your life to the Lord? I said, okay. So I let him pray. We did yeah, the prayer. Yeah. And to be honest with you, it was really, it was different because that's not like, it wasn't an altar call. It wasn't, yeah, yeah. but 
I remember driving back and there was just, there was really like this piece over me where it was like, you're fine. Yeah. You're in the middle of nowhere. You You'll be fine. Your ankle will be fine. You're gonna be good. Everything is just gonna be perfectly okay. And it's funny because they said five, six weeks. I was out for two and a half weeks. So I healed quicker. Yeah. My first at bat back, I'm in Mahoney Valley, um, Ohio, like right outside of Akron. First at bat, I'm leading off the game. First pitch I see off the top of the wall, center field triple. Yeah. I'm just standing at third, wiping my pants off. And, and at that moment I said, it was real. Like this yeah. is real. Yeah. So it's funny that you say that like in the middle of nowhere, you're in Poughkeepsie, but you weren't alone. I wasn't. Yeah. And but that's the first time I really felt like I really wasn't alone. Well, and and you know, there's all different ways to find the Lord. Uh, I'm getting the sense that um, that was the Lord telling you you needed to go in there. And I'm also getting the sense, and you know, I'm, I'm no one important, that there was no one else going in there because you needed that one-on-one -on -one time. Mm -hmm. You needed somebody to deliver you the message and know again in that unique situation that you're not alone. Yep. Well, obviously that helped your ankle healed you're able to move on you take the next step now you're in the big league where are you at what are you doing how's that work how, how did it go so 2005 my grandmother and my mom were just with me in durham north carolina i was in AAA, and they were there like the whole week and the very last game that they were leaving i go 0 for 5 three strikeouts the last strikeout i looked ball way inside it was a ball and I look back and, they, and I made the last out of the still, game. Still telling yourself that. Oh, it's 100% of all. Oh, yeah, okay. I'm going to lie. Absolutely, absolutely. So I, so I look back at the umpire, and because it's the last out of the game, there's nothing I can even say. He's gone. Nobody to talk to. There's no one to talk to. <laughs> so I go into my locker, and I'm putting my stuff down, and then my manager calls me in, and he's like, Cortez, come here. And he's like yelling. I'm like, oh, great. Go for five, three strikeouts. And I'm hit well at the time. Um, that year, I was having a great year. I started in double A, and... It was in AAA hitting like three something. And he calls me in and he goes, did you really let a ball go for third <laughs> strike to end the game? And I go, yeah, I go, Skip, like it was a ball. And he goes, whatever. He goes, doesn't matter. And he pushes over a piece of paper. He goes, that's your itinerary. You're going to Chicago. Wow. And I go, what? I'm like, what? He goes, you're going to the big leagues. So to me, I mean, obviously I was happy. I'm going to the big leagues, that's my dream. But to me, I thought it was crazy. I went back to my, my locker. I wasn't even like jumping around. Yeah. I was in awe. Because yeah. I was in awe because it was one of these one of these God moments again, where I was like, "You're really gonna call me up <laughs> when I went 0 for five yeah. with three strikeouts? Yeah. I've been begging for this yeah. for like three weeks, and I'm hitting 350, and I'm you know, 10 for my last 20. Yeah. You wait till now. Yeah. So I thought it was kind of funny. Um, and then I end up leaving. Just like the Lord, they'll, they'll take you where you are. Mm -hmm. That's just where you happen to be. They still had a place for you. Absolutely. Yeah. So I got dressed, took a shower, went out to my uh, a truck, and I called my mom. And she had just landed back in California. And I had told her, um, I said, hey, uh, I told about the game. Went over five, three strikeouts. I said, <laughs> but it doesn't matter. I said, I'm going to Chicago. What do you mean? I'm going to Chicago. I'm going to the big leagues. Yeah. And so I can hear her screaming on the side. <laughs> And I'm just like, I got the phone like this on the side of the road. So I mean, it was, it was great. It was um, obviously everything I ever dreamed of, hoped for and prayed for. And uh, I'll always remember it. Yeah, tell me a little bit about your big league career. So big leagues, went up there, didn't get the type of opportunity I really wanted. Mm -hmm. um, was 23 in the big leagues. Mm -hmm. I, was, I was a prospect um, and I was really just kind of filling in and playing. Yeah. Um, so for about two and a half months, General manager basically said, "Hey, look, we can't have you in the big leagues just sitting here. Yeah, um, you know, playing, you're, you're not playing ball. You're not playing. They're no. like, you're a prospect. You got to go back down. So I was actually excited to get sent down the first time I was up. No, yeah. uh, got sent down first at bat, hit a home run. Okay, Whew. and I was like, feeling good. I was okay. feeling good. All right. I was okay. like, I just want to play. I can still do this. You yeah. know, like yeah. I, I had all this money mm -hmm. and no play, yeah. or less money and play. And you, honestly, I, I was like, I want to play. Yeah. So I, I was like, oh, don't worry about it. It's fine." Lou Pinella had called me in the office. I said, can you just sign this real quick, my lineup card? Thank you, I gotta go, see ya. <laughs> and I wanted to play baseball. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So did that and I was with them for a couple of years, got traded to the Royals, um, went back to the big leagues with them, I was with the White Sox, back to the Rays. So those three organizations, Rays, White Sox, and uh, back then it was the double Rays, so Rays, White yep. Sox, and Royals. Nice, nice. 
All right, so what can be a difficult time for, for big league people, people that get to the pinnacle, the best you know, group of people in the world at what they do, talk about the transition. I, I heard a term, uh, bat flips to house flips. Talk about the transition. So bat flips to house flips, so in the name, instead of you know, bat flipping homers and hits, um, now we're flipping houses. Okay. Um, I always wanted to do real estate, even when I was you know, in minor league baseball, um, just didn't have the time. So as I got out of you know, baseball, I had a couple odd end jobs. Um, and that's the crazy thing is a lot of people don't know what to do when they're done playing yeah. whatever sport that they're playing. And you see this all the time. You see guys who are multimillionaires in basketball and football, and you know, they, they have these issues because their identity always lied in that sport. And I think, and I'm happy that my career wasn't as good as others because I feel like I would have been the type of person that my identity would have lied in that sport. Yeah. And when it was an easy transition for me, because when I got out of that, I knew my identity did not lie in baseball. No. It lied in the Lord. It, and he told me I was gonna do certain things. It just, you know, what route was that gonna be? Yeah. Now, without that relationship, I don't know where I'm gonna be. No. I have people to this day that still call me and they're asking me, what, what should I do? And no. I'm like, I don't know because I'm not you. I can tell you how to get from point A to point yeah, Z. Yeah. I can help you execute, but you got to figure out what it is that you really want to execute. Yeah. So the transition for me, you know, I ended up finding real estate like yeah. I wanted to. Yeah. Um, you know, we buy a lot of houses in Southern California. So Riverside County, San Diego County, we go in there, um, you know, all the beat up houses, things that need work. Yeah. Um, we fix them up, we have a crew, we make them look beautiful again, throw them back on the market and we move on to the next one. So kind of love that. I, I enjoy it. Um, it's just myself and my business partner, um, Chad Decker, and he played baseball in the Padres organization. So he was a pitcher. So he was, he was down with the name. Uh -huh. I said, uh -huh. Hey, let's do the name. We both play baseball. It's yeah. be cool. We both play baseball. Yeah. Now we're, now we're doing houses. Yeah. So, and you know, we're our, our own bosses and we're able to, you know, go to this house, go to that house. We live at Home Depot and Lowe's and, and all these things. So like, I enjoy what, it, what I do now. Um, it wasn't an easy transition, but, but I will say having that relationship and, and having that backbone and that, and that solid foundation was everything that was in between made it so much easier. Again, you're not alone. Exactly. The next transition in your life. All right, you're probably like me. Got to play a little ball, love baseball. I have a hard time going to a little league game and watching a kid with a bad swing. I'm the guy that stays to the end of the game, tries to show a kid a pointer or two. The kid gets a hit next time. They call you up. They think you're the they think you're the actual savior, uh, you know. So we try to help, but it sounds like you're still connected to baseball. I am. So I, I I've done travel ball. Uh, I did it for about four or five years. I started my own organization, um, and then I started my own company doing uh, private lessons. So. I actually weeded away from travel ball. It was a lot of time, a lot of effort. Um, I enjoyed it, um, but you're managing, you know, parents and kids and schedules. Not as and, much baseball. Yeah, as not you, as, as much baseball yeah. as you think. So, you know, I kind of consolidated the efforts in baseball and decided to just stick with one-on-one. -on -one. So right now I have a lot of one-on-one -on -one clients, anywhere from like nine years old to guys that are 19, 20 playing in the minor leagues. Yeah. So I work on defense, hitting. I have a facility up in Temecula. Um, after I do this show, I'm gonna go up there in a couple hours. Yeah. I got, a, I got a, a kid that I'm working with, a nine-year-old. So I'll be with him for a half an hour to an hour. So I, I stay close, but I stay kind of far. Um, the game's changing a lot. Um, you know, the world's changing a lot. There's, there's a lot of- uh, The world needs baseball. <laughs> the world, yeah. <laughs> Can't wait for it to come back. Yeah, so I mean, I stay connected um, the best that I can. I still have all my connections with baseball. Um, I, you know, I'm happy to see now that these kids are going to be able to play. And trust me, I see the back end of it too yeah. because yeah. they come to me because they want more because they're not getting the games. Yeah. So now that they're able to get the games, now I can just kind of polish them up a little bit. And, you know, that's, I'm not just spending all the time to, to fill the void of the fact that they can't play. Yeah. Now it's like, let me, you know, hone your swing. Let me get you dialed in. Yeah. You go execute in the game. Yeah. Well, listen, you obviously have had a, a very high level of talent and skills, and it's nice to hear that you're giving back. But I always remember being in sports and thinking of guys who made it to the big leagues as these, these bigger than life, 
you know, they they walk on they walk on water. They're they're just they're, they're miracles. And then you find out that they have regular stories and regular lives and all the normal things that go on for people. And the ones that tend to be the most successful are the ones that recognize they were blessed. So here on the yard is faith and sports collide. I'm guessing the gifts you received uh, are a big part of the story, uh, from 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 the big leagues to where you are today. Tell us about tell us about your faith in sports. So for me, like I said before, as, as a younger kid, I, I knew there was something always there. Didn't really quite put my finger on it until I got a little bit older. Um, and in, and in God's timing, it was perfect because I think he showed up right when I needed him the most. It was, it was literally when I got dumped out into the middle of the ocean by myself. Mm -hmm. You know, when I got on that plane and I went to New York, that's when I was probably the most alone in you know, separated from my family, my friends, and, and the normality, and that comfort zone. Mm -hmm. um, so as uncomfortable as it was, showed up at the right time, and you know, at that moment, it played a huge role throughout my whole career. And I could sit here and tell you every level I went to, mm -hmm. and I can tell you those awe moments and those, um, you know, just those miracles, or what did Miles, Miles used to call those things something when, when the, when they would just pop off. But I remember he used to say stuff like, the, the, oh, the woos. He used yeah. to call them the woos. The woos. Okay. I had um, so many woos sitting on the bus going in the middle of somewhere and then and I'd get a woo. Or, yeah. you know, um, being able to go from this city to that city at just the right timing. Yeah. Um, I have a kid that sent me something on Facebook the other day. It's a picture of him and I the day I got called up to the big leagues the first time. Mm -hmm. He was a little kid, he was like nine or 10. He found me on Facebook, mm -hmm. he had the photo, he sent it to me, he said, my dad found this. And I remember he came up to me in first class, first time I ever flew first class. He said, can I take a picture with you? Because mm -hmm. him and his dad were reading the newspaper and they looked at me and they were like, is this you? Yeah. I said, yeah, they're like, oh, yeah. it's your first day. He ends up sending me a photo of when him and I were, you know, 2005 and he was like nine or 10 now fast forward the, the kid is like a medical genius kid at duke university that's awesome and i'm like like come on <laughs> this doesn't have you know what i mean <clears throat> yeah so just crazy stuff like that um played a huge role in my life yeah. uh, especially throughout my whole career um, and then obviously till today well we're all blessed to have you here we appreciate your story fernando Glad you came to the yard. Thank you for your time. <clears throat> you know, listening to Fernando talk about his story and the transitions he had to make, uh, one thing that certainly resonates for me is that when you need him, uh, the Lord's always going to be there. Uh, some people find him at different times, different places for different reasons. Uh, you just have to be willing to listen. You have to be willing to raise your hand when no one else wants to go with that strange guy that wants to talk to you. That strange guy could be your angel. That strange guy could be the one that introduces you to the Lord. So. Uh, if you don't already know them, be looking for it. Uh, if you do know them, share uh, the gifts that we're all blessed with, and we all have them. When you recognize what they are, uh, they get better when you're grateful uh, from which they came. I want to thank you all for tuning into the yard today. I uh, look forward to having you guys back real soon. Thanks for watching.